Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Nicola Colonna from Paul Scherer Institute in uh, Switzerland. And first of all, I would like to thank the organizer for the invitation for having me here. Um, and, and actually to open this uh, uh, 90 developer meeting. Uh, actually, I wouldn't call myself a, a developer of 90. I'm more a user than still I'm very, very happy to be here and looking forward for discussion because uh, How is it better? Uh, yeah, I was saying because uh, I'm very happy to be here because um, uh, what I'm going to present uh, now is a um, is a is a, a work we have been doing in uh, in uh, Lausanne uh, since a few years now. And it's tightly related to to the Vanier uh, Vanier function and Vanier ninety in particular, uh, and this is about a, a spectral a spectral functional approach to spectroscopy that we name Kubman compliance functional. And in particular, it's, uh, somebody's complaining about it. Uh, and in particular, it's implementation in, uh, in quantum espresso and the connection with the uh, Vanier 90, 90 code. So I'll first uh, just give you a brief introduction on uh, Kuban spectral functions, what they are and what are the, the basic assumptions uh, behind. And then I show you some benchmark uh, to prove that this is indeed a very effective approach. Uh, and then I go to the central uh, part of the presentation that is the, the application to extended system where the connection with Vanier function is, uh, uh, is made apparent uh, and, and the, the interface with Vanier 90 code is, is a key for this development. Uh, so the, the central quantity we want to target are charge excitation. Uh, you uh, probably are very familiar with this. Essentially, this is the, the band structure of your uh, material and it's uh, uh, not a ground state property. So in principle, density functional theory uh, can't help you in this, uh, in this respect. <clears throat> Still, you, want, you would like to be able to uh, accurately reproduce those quantities essentially because they are connected with the, with uh, experiments like uh, direct or inverse photoemission uh, spectroscopy or uh, angle result photoemission spectroscopy. So then the question is how do we uh, simulate those, those quantities? So for what concerns standard system, Green's function method is uh, considered to be a good compromise between uh, accuracy and computational uh, cost. And indeed uh, for many, uh, weekly to moderately correlated material, the uh, Green's function theory already within the so-called GW approximation um, give very accurate uh, result for many, many material. Here you see just an example for uh, silicon. In particular, you see that the pen gap is, is correctly uh, reproduced. Now, the price you pay is that you have to, uh, to work with a non-local and frequency dependent object, which is the one body Green's function. Uh, and this is way more complex than what we are probably used to uh, residency functional theory where the basic variable is the ground state density. So if, if I do a step uh, backward to, to density functional theory and uh, I take the connection band structure, now I know this has no obvious connection with the actual band structure of the material. Nevertheless, the, the, the quality, at least the uh, qualitative agreement with the target band structure is quite remarkable. Apart the, the well-known and unfamous underestimation of the of the band gap. So, so the question is, uh, uh, can we have just something in between those two approaches, trying to match the uh, efficiency of a uh, functional approach, uh, like density functional theory, and the accuracy of uh, of Green's functional theory? And our answer to this question is actually Kuban's functional that are based on a very um, simple uh, idea uh, on the observation that essentially what is missing in uh, approximate density functional theory is uh, uh, the fact that the single particle can value your Konishama energy uh, epsilon high here doesn't really match with the definition of a charge excitation that is the energy differences between the neutral system and the system with plus or minus one, one electron. Uh, contrast this with Green's function theory, where this is uh, enforced in, uh, by construction. The pole of the one body Green's function actually are the single, uh, the um, charge excitation of your system. And the reason why this is missing in density function theory is essentially because the, the energy has a uh, spurious, uh, almost quadratic behavior on the occupation of the, of the orbital. 
Now, if you remember Yanak theorem, or I tell you the eigenvalue is nothing but the derivative of the energy with respect to the occupation number. So essentially, uh, in this cartoon here, the eigenvalue is nothing but the tangent uh, to, the, to the red curve uh, that represents a, a typical local semi-local density function. And now you see that this, this arrow here, the derivative doesn't really point toward the, the, the energy of a system with n minus one electric. So the basic idea is uh, to revert this spurious quadratic behavior into what we call Koopman compliant uh, behavior, uh, this blue line here. And now you see that you're, if you're able to do that, uh, then the, the eigenvalue, so the derivative will correctly give you uh, um, the, the uh, total energy differences between the neutral and the system with plus or minus one energy. So this is very simple and actually, um, uh, yeah, just let me say that this is not, not new. Actually, in, uh, already in the FT, you have something similar. You might be familiar. You might know this is the well-known piecewise linearity condition of density function theory, but this apply only to the energy as a function of the total number of electrons, or if you want, uh, as a function of the occupation of the highest molecular, occupation of the highest molecular orbital. Here we extend this in an heuristical way to, to all the uh, electrons in the system and to all the occupation number. So, uh, we are more general than density functional theory in this respect. Uh, and the nice thing is that you can do this with very simple uh, uh, correction to your density function that here I call pi i kc coupon compliant that actually turns out to depend on the orbital densities. So this is, uh, of course, a generalization of the FT, as I was saying, uh, but still way simpler than uh, uh, Green's function theory because now we are central variable, central quantity are the orbital density. So n local uh, and real, uh, real object. Now, I, I don't have time to go into the detail. I just want to mention that this correction are actually uh, uh, devised uh, enforcing the linearity condition I was explaining in the previous slide. And uh, uh, you end up with a, a very simple uh, expression that are actually given in terms of the actual exchange and correlation energy of your underlying density function. And here we, just to uh, set the, the, the nomenclature, we refer to Ki is the, the black uh, term here, which is the simplest uh, uh, correction we, we have. And then we have an ad, a more advanced one that we call KIPC, where we add an extra term in red here that is inspired by the uh, self-interaction correction by Perdue and Zunger. And with this extra term, the approach becomes exact for any one electron system. So this would give you the right, the exact solution for any one electron system. Now, these, these expressions are quite simple, but essentially are derived in, in, in a very strong approximation. Essentially, that is that when we uh, add or remove one particle and we analyze the energy, we assume that the orbit does not readjust. And this is just to work out explicitly the expression in this very simple and compact form. But of course, it is a, is, a, is a strong approximation. If you want, this would be the analogous of Koopman uh, theorem in Arthur Falk, where you have the linearity, but working in a frozen orbital picture. So what you're missing is a relaxation screen effect that actually are, are uh, central to correctly describe charge excitation. And we introduce this with some orbital uh, density dependent screening coefficient that can be computed fully ab initio. During the year, we develop several ways to, to, to get this uh, screening coefficient. Probably the most general one and what we are happy with at the moment is, uh, is uh, given here in, in, uh, in this formula. It's a well-defined average of the microscop microscopic dielectric uh, function of your, of your system. Again, uh, if you want to know more, I will be more than happy to show you the, the, the detail and where this comes from. But essentially, you are uh, probing uh, the, the response uh, uh, of the system uh, due to an addition of a tiny fraction of an electron in the, in, the, in the system. And the numerator is when you account for the response of the system, the denominator is uh, what you don't. And the ratio between the two give you a, a measure of the uh, importance of the screening effect. And finally, uh, what is uh, uh, important, uh, uh, especially in, in this context and with, uh, in, in connection with binary function is the third property of this class of function that is the localization of the variational orbital. Actually, because of this uh, orbital uh, dependent term up here, the, the function is no more unitary invariant under unitary rotation of the occupied manifold. And this means that the minimization uh, drives you toward a, a unique set of uh, what we call minimizing uh, or variational orbital 
that actually uh, are typically very localized and resemble Bohr's orbital molecule or maximum localized Fanier function in, in a standard system. And this is given by the function itself. So at the end of the minimization, we have this set of, of orbital. Here you see two of them for a polyacetylene chain. And once you reach the minimum, uh, you, you typically take your matrix or Lagrangian multiplier that we used to keep the orthogonality during the, the minimization. You diagonalize it and you get the canonical orbital and um, uh, eigenvalue that actually has a direct connection with the experiment. Uh, uh, so like a Dyson orbital in this function or, or charge excitation in general. Okay, this is a very brief summary of Kuhlman. Um, but as I was saying at the beginning, now we have a more general framework than density functional theory. Now the basic variable are the orbital density. And another striking difference uh, with respect to uh, standard conic sham is that now we have one potential for each, uh, for each orbital. So this is clearly more, more general. It's also uh, reminiscent of uh, a quasi-particle approximation in, in this functional theory where you have one uh, self energy at the given value of the, of the uh, frequency for each uh, um, Again, state, and, and I will show you that this is enough to, to uh, actually describe um, uh, charge excitation in the system. So the first thing we did was actually to take uh, a large set of uh, uh, a standardized set of molecules. This is the GW100 set. You, you might be familiar with this. Uh, uh, it has been introduced to benchmark and validate uh, different GW implementation. And for this reason, we have uh, accurate quantum chemistry result. Um, experiment, uh, but also uh, many different results for, for different uh, uh, and from different approaches, ranging from simple correction to EDFT, like the Zunger, at the one half, and then Artifoc and, and different GW depending on the starting point or full self consistent GW, quasi particle self consistent GW, dielectric dynamic type function. And here I, I look at the, we look at the uh, mean absolute error for the first ionization potential evaluated as minus the energy of the homo eigenvalue. And in red, uh, I highlight the, the, the coupons function. Here you see Ki, Kpc that I show you in, in the previous slide. And an intermediate version where we apply in a perturbative fashion the Kpc Hamiltonian on top of the Ki uh, ground state. And as you can see, the performance is quite remarkable. We are uh, uh, in line with, uh, uh, or even better than, um, most of the uh, GW result uh, we have up now, and we are almost as good as the best GW, which in this case, or at least the last time I checked, was GW not on top of PD0. And this, despite the fact that this is quite a sim simple uh, approach, uh, I uh, highlight this down here, again, where we essentially deal with local and orbital dependent uh, uh, real quantities that are the orbital densities. Now, I have to be, uh, fair and just to say that uh, this is uh, exactly true, but, but you need this extra computational cost uh, uh, given by the fact that you have to calculate this screening coefficient. If you want, uh, as an analogy, this is pretty much like in DFT plus U. This is a very small overhead on, on density function theory, but still you need to compute the, the value of the uh, U parameter, and this might require additional calculation. This is a, another example to show that not only the first ionization potential, but also other uh, um, uh, single particle eigenvalue are correctly uh, reproduced. Uh, here we took a set of uh, 27 small molecules that are relevant for photovoltaic. You see the, the fullerene and the acene. And again, uh, this is the average performance of Ki in blue and Kpc in red compared to the state of the art in uh, GW. And you see, again, we are uh, in line with uh, this function theory or even slightly better, especially for uh, KPZ, for both the first ionization potential and the electron affinity. Again, evaluate this minus the, the energy of the eigenvalue. And last, I uh, just want to mention that also deeper states are correctly reproduced. Uh, here we computed the theoretical photomission experiment for, this is an example for C60 fullerene. And you see that, that KIPZ is in uh, remarkably good agreement with, uh, with, uh, with experiment. And this is actually true for all the system we looked at. So uh, if, if you want all the details on how this uh, 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 photomission spectra is calculated, you can, you can uh, check out this, this reference down here. Okay, and now I just want to go to the central part of the presentation that is uh, uh, how do we extend it all this to a uh, periodic system or um, uh, crystalline system. And this is where uh, the, the localization of the variational orbital and actually the, the connection with the function is, is apparent and it's uh, 
key to the success of, of the Kuban function. And in order to show you this in some detail, uh, I start with this, uh, with this slide. Essentially, I, I probably mentioned this or, or not, but I just uh, want to say that in a nutshell, what Kuban's function uh, do is actually enforcing a function for the concept of delta SCF. So the single particle eigenvalue as is replaced by a total energy differences between the neutral system and the system with plus or minus one electron. Now you, you might know this, uh, but it's well known that uh, standard delta SCF uh, on top of local and semi-local function is quite good for small molecule, but it's bound to fail in the thermodynamic limits. And to prove this, uh, uh, we, we did this computational uh, experiment. Uh, we take uh, a, a chain of uh, uh, an arcane chain and we made we made it uh, increasingly longer and longer for the uh, thermodynamic limit uh, represented by the uh, polyacetylene chain. And we look at the first ionization potential, again, estimated in a different way. Down here in, in black uh, triangle, you see the, the uh, homo from PB, and you know this is completely wrong, both for small molecules and new thermodynamic limit. You have to compare with this. Uh, star here, blue star, and, and, and this uh, uh, red star here that represent experiment or uh, uh, quantum chemistry calculation for small molecule. Then we look at that SCF. So you really do a, a two SCF calculation, one with the system with an electron and one for the system with n minus one electron. And this is well known. It's quite good for small molecule, but it, it goes back to the homo uh, PB when you approach the thermodynamic thing. And the reason for this failure is a combination of two facts. The first one is that you're using a local function. And the second one is that you are removing your electron from a, um, from a block state or a canonical state that becomes uh, more and more delocalized as you approach the thermodynamic limit. So the solution is either you go for a highly non-local uh, functional or you remove the, the, the constraint on the uh, delocalization of the canonical object. And this is actually what one does essentially they impose a delta SCF still working on a, with a local or semi local function, but we enforce this delta SCF on a set of Banier like objects that are represented here for that, those are two of them for the, for the chain. And for this reason, uh, we have a finite correction both for, uh, for small molecule and in the thermodynamic limit, where especially KPC recover a, a, an extremely good uh, um, agreement with, uh, with, the, with the experiment. So this is just to say that uh, the localization of the relational orbital is a key to get uh, uh, accurate correction also for, for a standard system. This was a toy model. We, we, we applied this to a set of uh, 30 semiconductors for which we looked at the band gap uh, and seven, surface, seven uh, ionization potential from seven surfaces. And again, um, uh, we compare with the uh, experiment and uh, uh, with function theory here in the table you see the average performance of the function and again we, we find it's, uh, it's uh, quite remarkable the, the accuracy of uh, especially uh, KIPC and even more remarkable is the fact that the performance is consistent uh, for both the band gap and the ionization potential which is not the case in this function theory so uh, quasi particle self consistent GW gives a very uh, good estimation of the band gap but the absolute position of the band edges is not very accurate and the opposite is true for, for uh, GNW not so also non self consistent GW. And it's quite uh, in, impressive and remarkable that KPC can do both jobs at the same time with the very same level of accuracy. Okay, uh, but now let me just mention something that um, was some kind of headache for us uh, for uh, uh, a few months, essentially the fact that we are uh, we need to work with a set of localized orbital apparently uh, break the, the transition symmetry of the, of the system. Essentially, you have to think of this kind of a, a defect in your system. So we are adding a charge in a very localized uh, state. So in principle, the, the natural way to address this is in a supercell. And indeed, this is what we did up to now, working in a supercell even if the system is perfectly periodic. And the question is, do we have block symmetry? even if we are working with this set of localized orbital. And the, the answer is actually yes, and this is the work done by Riccardo Gennari uh, at EPFL. And the, the, the key observation is that actually the variational orbital, the one that comes out from the minimization actually are Vanier-like. And by Vanier-like, I mean they satisfy some sort of translational property that, that is you can reconstruct all the variational orbital simply taking the one in the, your home cell and translating by the artist vector of the primitive cell. And this is the only 
thing you have to notice. And uh, if you use this, uh, then you can prove that the coupon potential actually commute with all the translational operator of uh, the primitive cell. And this means we are uh, uh, block compliant. And this means that we have a, a band structure underlying, even if we are working in, in a super cell. And then, of course, the, this is more conceptual than, than practical, uh, because we, at, at that stage, we still have to do calculation in, in a supercell, because this is pretty, pretty easy to get forward to do. But then we can unfold the band structure and obtain the, the, the entire band structure, for instance, of silicon in the primitive, uh, in the primitive um, Brigland zone. And this is important, especially if you have a, a system with an indirect band gap, where we, for instance, in silicon, the, the bottom of the conduction band is between gamma and x at, at some random point. And this, again, is what done by uh, Riccardo De Gennaro. Again, here, the agreement with the experiment is, is uh, extremely, uh, extremely good. And now we can have also uh, a complete band structure of, of, of the material. And last step, and this is where actually the connection with Vanier 90 is, uh, is even more uh, important, uh, is uh, essentially then the question is, so if we have translational symmetry, can't we just exploit them from the beginning and directly work in a, in a primitive cell? And the answer again is, is yes. It's not that trivial as uh, if you were working with a, a canonical uh, connection state, but still you can do that. And the key observation is again that the, the basic quantity again are the orbital density. And those are, if you want, Vanier orbital density that by definition are periodic on the supercell commensurate with the number of key points you want to, uh, uh, you want to have in your center of the uh, primitive cell linear zone. But the key observation is that uh, uh, given the fact that the variational orbital are Vanier uh, like, so they have this translational property, you can rewrite this object as a sum of quantity that are periodic on the primitive cell simply modulated by a, a, a phase pattern. Uh, and this is all you need to know to recast a, a problem whose natural dimension is the supercell into a primitive cell plus the sampling of the Brillouin zone. If you want, as an analogy, this is pretty much the same that happened in uh, phonon calculation. You can either do a frozen phonon calculation where you build up a supercell that is commensurate with the wavelength you want to, of the perturbation that you want to study, or you use the machinery of density functional perturbation theory where you decompose the perturbation into a sum of monochromatic one in the primitive cell, and you use a primitive cell approach and the same thing of the bigger and so on. Of course, the, 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 the advantage is, uh, is uh, from a computational point of view is, is, uh, is tremendous because now you can, you can work with uh, a, small, a small cell. You can, uh, in principle, uh, parallelize over uh, two points, uh, exploit uh, in principle um, uh, uh, space group symmetry of your system. And this has been implemented in, uh, in uh, Quantum Espresso uh, at this stage uh, as, uh, as a post-processing. Essentially, the basic assumption is that now um, our variational orbital actually coincide with maximum localized Vanier function. So we skip the minimization uh, uh, and we use uh, simply uh, maximum localized Vanier function obtained from a Vanier 90 uh, calculation. So, but everything starts with the PWSCF calculation. This is the LBA band structure of Gallium Marcenite. Then we uh, use the Vanier 90 code to, to obtain the Vanier function. And we have to do this uh, um, in a two-step procedure. So we Vanierize separately occupied an empty uh, manifold. This to have meaningful uh, localized uh, orbital for a charge excitation process. And then as I was saying, we have used this as a, a proxy for variational orbital. And in most of the case, this is a, an extremely good approximation. So the minimization really doesn't modify much the, 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 uh, the maximum localized Vanier function. And then we um, implement the interface with Vanier 90, and uh, this is the coupon code, where essentially we take the output of PWSCF, uh, uh, essentially the connection state. Uh, the output of Vanier 90, essentially the, the rotational matrices that allows to uh, go from the uh, block representation to the to the Vanier gauge for the connection state. And then you have to build up the basic ingredient that are the uh, periodic part of the Vanier density, which is uh, given simply by this, uh, this, uh, this object here. And once you have this, you can build up the ingredient needed for the Koopman functional. First of all, uh, you have to compute the screening coefficient. And this is the real bottleneck of the, of the calculation, uh, because essentially this requires uh, a linear response uh, uh, calculation. Essentially, you have to, to compute uh, the, the action of this uh, dielectric matrix uh, on some uh, 
perturbation that you, you can imagine this as we are uh, perturbing, slightly perturbing the system, adding a tiny fraction of an electron into a Vanier function. Essentially, the perturbation is something that looks like this, is the arc exchange and correlation potential due to the, uh, to the Vanier function. But the nice thing is that uh, uh, you can uh, uh, recast this uh, into a, um, uh, a sum of um, monochromatic contribution. Again, you can work within the primitive cell. And this is implemented uh, with the machinery of density functional perturbation theory. So a split is sum of empty state uh, for the uh, cultivation of epsilon is, is, um, is not needed. Um, and this is, everything is well known uh, for those of you that are not familiar. Essentially, you have to solve a set of self-consistent equations that are uh, very similar to the uh, standard one in a ground state calculation uh, for, uh, for, uh, for DFT. But now instead of looking for the self-consistent charge density, you look for the self-consistent self -consistent variation of the charge density due to this particular perturbation up here. And once you did that, uh, you, you can build up the Kuchman Hamiltonian, uh, and this is uh, computationally very cheap compared to the calculation of the scaling coefficient. But the nice thing is that now you have it in a, in a, in a Vanier representation, so you can do all the post-processing uh, tool that you can imagine and that I learned uh, quite advanced uh, uh, looking at the, at the, at the talk uh, from the Vanier Summer School last week. I mean, from a, from a physical point of view, what happened is that essentially the, band, the valence band is pushed downward, the uh, conduction band is pushed upward uh, a bit, and this uh, results in a band gap that is in an extremely good agreement with, with, with the experiment. Okay, and here I just uh, uh, show you some more examples. Again, this is gallium arsenide. On, on the right, you have three i, and I compare with the standard LDA or uh, a quite common approach uh, that is uh, this HSC hybrid function. And I compare with the experiment, this horizontal uh, uh, dashed line represents the band gap in green, the, the band width of the uh, valence band in blue, and the position of the D state uh, in red down here. So uh, uh, we know the, the typical failure of, of, of LDA, HSC correct for the band gap, uh, a bit also for the position of the D state, but worse than the, 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 the bandwidth. And KI tends to to this uh, orbital dependent correction can uh, reproduce correctly the, the band gap, improves a lot the, the description of the D state uh, and the bandwidth uh, actually is unchanged uh, uh, compared to LDA. This is a peculiarity of, of KI. This to show that it's, uh, this, this approach is, uh, uh, it's, um, I mean, the quality is not uh, system dependent as it happens for hybrid function where you tune this mixing parameter once and for all, and this is the case of, of HSC, but this parameter might be, and in principle are uh, system dependent, and here you see that for a wide band gap insulator, HSC is not, is not good anymore, uh, while uh, KI, because of this uh, uh, screening coefficient, uh, correctly reproduce the, the dielectric response of your system and gives you, uh, uh, also in this case, an accurate estimation of the band gap once you remove the, the zero point uh, contribution from the, from the experiment. And this is a more challenging test case. Uh, this is zinc oxide, which is well known to be uh, challenging also for uh, uh, GW calculation. And again, uh, here, uh, the failure of LDA is even, is even uh, um, more remarkable, essentially, because the, the D states down here from zinc are too high in energy, and this pushed up uh, the, the oxygen P state, and it closed even more the, the, the band gap. Again, HSC do a quite uh, good job, goes in the right direction, and KI is, uh, is, uh, is even better and almost in perfect agreement with this guy. Okay, and with this, I uh, conclude. I, I, I hope I convince you that now we, we have a, a functional approach to get accurate uh, uh, charge excitation in a finite and uh, extended system. The, the low complexity of the approach actually uh, is, is very appealing and promising for automated uh, approach, in particular uh, with the uh, um, automated vanierization. It's open source, it will be released uh, soon uh, with uh, Quantum, uh, Quantum Express, and the basic idea is that we can have, uh, this can be used as a core pillar for a, a computational infrastructure that can be accessible to a broad audience. I just need to acknowledge uh, uh, people because I'm not the only one working on this. Uh, uh, Nicola Mazzari is leading the project, Andrea Ferretti is one of the first uh, uh, developers together with Ismaila Labo, and then uh, uh, Lynn Guyan, a former postdoc, and Riccardo De Ginar and Edward Iscott uh, uh, at present uh, at, at the PFL, and many other people that contributed to the project. 
And now I, I should be open for questions, but actually I might start with some questions for, for you essentially to, to streamline this calculation. Actually, we, we would like to, to have a, a robust and automatic binarization. And I learned from the summer school last week that we have something already in place, with, which is the CDM method. Also, we have the automatic orbital approach uh, by Jung Fan working uh, at Lausanne. And the other important thing is that we need to have a separate banalization of occupied and empty manifold. So uh, this would be great uh, if I can discuss with some of you, and particularly with Fan, who sent me an email uh, this morning saying that he's actually working on this and has some nice idea to, to get this uh, working. And from a computational point of view, it would be extremely relevant for us to be able to work uh, uh, on the irreducible uh, Brillouin um, wedge of the K-point in the Brillouin zone, essentially because uh, well, the Hamiltonian itself is not, it's not ideal, but the, the calculation of the screen requires actually a double sum over, over k points, so we would really benefit uh, from um, the use of uh, group screening. Okay, and with this, I, I thank you all for the attention and I open for, for questions. Yeah, the, maybe first we answer a question that was asked by Sergey on Zoom. Uh, Sergey asks, what is the relation between maximum localization and localization by Koopman's function? Or for instance, for some topological materials, when your functionalities cannot be located, okay, it's hard to localization in one of directional Koopman's orbitals always localized. Well, no, this is a very, very good question. Typically, or for the system we, we, we looked up to now, that essentially are uh, 3D periodic system with no uh, trivial topology. Uh, the, the variation of the actually uh, are very similar to Panier function. The, I, I, the, the basic idea is that actually what Kuhlman's function, the minimization is driven by a self factory term. And, and you know from chemistry at least that this is one of the uh, different ways you can get localized orbital. So uh, maximizing the, the self factory. Uh, now I don't remember the name for this localization procedure, but this is one of the possibility. And, all these localization procedures produce a very similar uh, Banyer function. And this is the reason why um, maximizing uh, R, R square or uh, uh, maximizing the self factory gives uh, pretty much the same result. But for, so I would expect that we have the same, uh, the same uh, uh, limitation uh, as you have in maximalized Banyer function for the system you were mentioning, but this is something we never really tried and it would be extremely, uh, uh, Nice to see how the minimization performs in this case. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. So, in the result that you were showing at the end, so you get amazing agreement with experiments, just to confirm. So, the experiment you subtract the zero point motion, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, you're so really for, comparing... for lithium fluoride, yes. Zinc oxide, I'm not sure. Probably no. Uh, it's something to check. I don't know. I mean, if you have any idea of how important it is for zinc oxide, very happy to, to hear or if you have some references. And for gallium arsenide, also we, we added the, the, the spin orbit uh, effect because this is not in the implementation yet. So we add or remove 0 0.1 uh, from, the, from our calculation to, to account for this. And also ZPR. If, uh, in, in for gallium arsenide, no. No, okay. But I think it's shouldn't be that, should be that small yeah. and and the other question is now that you have uh, both implementations so supercell and primitive cell have you done any comparison for example for gallium arsenide and particularly i'm interested in the the, the convergence rate so like to, to get the same value do you have some plot do you know how fast or slow the supercell converge to the single cell ki result for the same ki function yeah. So, so there are two things here. So um, in, this, in this implementation done with the primitive cell plus uh, the brilliant zone, we, we, we did some extra um, approximation, tiny approximation on the actual form of the function. So there's no one-to-one -one correspondence between this implementation and the supercell one. But this is a, a typically a, 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 a very uh, good approximation. And in principle, you would expect to see exactly the same result because it's really just a rewriting of your problem in supercell in, in a primitive cell plus center of the key point, apart from this small, uh, small implementation. The convergence uh, is something we didn't check, but actually the, the screen uh, or carefully, let's say. So in principle, the two has to converge uh, in the very same way. So the size of the supercell is exactly 
the same converging parameter as the number yeah. of key points in your in this implementation. Um, the screening coefficient uh, converge, uh, I, I think, well, it should converge uh, very, very easily in, in semiconductor. Uh, you, you know, you don't need that very large uh, K mesh to converge the electric property light in the, in the macroscopic electric function. For metals, or when the gap goes. Uh, so, so, in terms of Q grid, uh, is it like four, four, four? Yeah, six, sorry. Six? In this in this calculation, this is a six by six by six okay, okay, supercell, okay. and this is already enough for to have a, a decent uh, interpolation of the bands because again, now you can yeah, watch. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, but this, those are converged result. But I think even four by four by four for the screen, it's uh, it's something. Uh, okay, very nice. Uh, Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yes. Thank you very much for the talk. And um, I want, was wondering, uh, looking at your final result about uh, linear response, if there is any way to compute, uh, for example, vibrational properties or any other linear response properties with this kind of functionals. Thank you. Um, so you're asking if you can use these uh, as, uh, uh, let's say, the, the starting point for uh, a phonon calculation or um, so uh, not at this stage. Um, now everything is implemented uh, in a, if you want, uh, like in a G not W not, so it's uh, uh, really not fully set consistent. So, uh, but in principle, uh, you, you, I, I don't see any, any, any real uh, uh, obstacle to this, uh, apart that, well, uh, so not with the linear response, but maybe with a uh, frozen phonon approach, for sure, you, you do a super cell and, and, you, and you compute uh, the linear matrix in this way. So I think it's, it's doable. It may be a quick comment on this, uh, in the sense that the KI functional has the, exactly the same total energy of the base function you start with. Uh, so it's not giving you improved energetics from LDA or PB or PB soul. Uh, the KIPZ functional adds uh, this uh, Perdue-Zunger self-interaction correction uh, with a screening coefficient uh, that comes, if you want, from imposing a spectral property, imposing a linearization. This seems to be working well. So it's basically a local screen the FOC term. Uh, I think we have only one case uh, where we looked at this, that was some of the DNA and uh, RNA bases, mm -hmm. uh, and that term was giving uh, the right torsion of a certain angle that would it be. Uh, but it's not that we expect uh, particularly mm -hmm. exciting results uh, from the total energy and thus the phonons, yes. uh, apart from the fact that you have consistently in KIPZ a screen fog exchange. Uh, that at the end is the same thing uh, that uh, hybrid functional in different flavors uh, give you. So, might be also so good. That, uh, the part of the correction is not uh, changing the total energy functional and thus you expect that the response to the functional is the same. Right? For KI, is absolutely the same. I mean, uh, and KI PC would be similar to a hybrid uh, with a, just a different flavor of a screened uh, FOC exchange. Uh, but again, to do phonons, uh, I think it would be simpler to do a uh, uh, finite differences uh, with phono mm. pi than trying to do a Sternheimer equation yes. on top of that. Exactly as also in the FT plus U. Yeah. I mean, there are phonons in the FT plus U with linear response, uh, but it's so much easier to do them by finite differences. If you want, there is uh, one additional concept uh, that is. Uh, this screening coefficient uh, is uh, configuration dependent. So when you take the first or the second derivative uh, of the total energy, you should take in principle into account that also the screening coefficient uh, is configuration dependent. So it contributes to the phonon frequency and that makes itself a little bit more complicated. Okay, <clears throat> other questions? Yes. Just now about say 
and <laughs> just quickly so for um for empty states that so the how does your result depend on the on the disentanglement window no good good very good question so this is something that we we, we need to explore more uh, systematically i would say but there is of course dependence because now your your function depends on the actual shape of the of the orbital density that you plug in so um of course i mean if the modification is dramatic then then you would expect to have also um uh sensible uh, changes in the plan gap or, or the property but if the the, the disentanglement and now I, here i'm not an expert but if it's just to to uh, give similar uh, vanier function just more localized or uh, then i would expect that the the, the dependence is not dramatic but in principle yes we are not. and this is true also for uh, for the for the occupied manifold if you get different uh, kind of linearization actually this is uh, counterbalanced by the screen coefficient that depends actually on the shape of the function but we have this uh, uh, time dependence but in principle, we have minimization, we know which is the, the right uh, uh, minimum, at least for, for occupied uh, running function. For empty, no, we don't have it. Okay. Maybe I, I have a question then. So the, you mentioned that implementation is done with the FPT and so with Q points. Uh, so also the vanillization part is done uh, in the primitive cell, not in the super cell. Yeah, he, he, in, in this uh, workflow, everything is done in a, in a primitive cell. So there's, uh, uh, I mean, it's really like a, a standard calculation. Uh, and the only thing you have, you have to do is this, uh, the, the FPT that, of course, is, is quite um, uh, computationally intense, but it's like the computation of the U with the U in of the But it's intensive in terms of time or in terms of memory? Uh, well, in, in terms of computational time, in the sense that that uh, uh, this is the, the real bottleneck of the calculation, uh, because it's I mean it's a linear response of course. So in principle, you you, you would need to, to solve a, a problem that is like a, a standard SCF in the FT, but for for, for each of non-equivalent and the function. I mean, in silicon, all of them are, are identical. You do it once, and that's all. But this is uh, an extra computational cost that you have to afford before the that case. Lisa.
So for those who are connected online, we will have a half an hour break and then we resume with our schedule uh, right over here. <laughs>